Georgia Fortunato. I'm Bethany. I'm Kristen. I'm Tracy. I'm Rita. I'm Miriam. I'm Carrie. I'm Ian. Hi, I'm Lisa. Kim Hamilton. And Laura Hirsch. Megan Graham. Grace Diaz. Lee Gaspar. Shilpa Knight. Zalda Collins. Donna Preet Gong. Amanda Simino. Mary Reynolds. Sue Turkheim. Brenda Borgard. This is my partner. Kristen Amicaliana. Jennifer Vecchio. I am Miriam Shalcross Smith. And I am Amy Shalcross Vogel. And we're mother and daughter in business. I am a woman. Hear me roll. In numbers too big to Hello, ignore. And welcome to Women's Business. My name is Dr. Marianne Shalcross Smith, known to most as Dr. Daycare. And I would like to welcome you to our program designed to educating our community on issues facing working women. I will be speaking to our guests in the area of arts, sciences, education, law, medicine, politics, and of course, women's business. The goal of the show is to provide information that only comes from personal experience and pass this information down to our daughters, nieces, neighbors, families, and friends. Much of the content will relate to the guest journey's chosen field, what they learned about the process of being in their career, and what they wish they knew before they began the journey. Since women-owned business is the fastest growing sector in the United States of America, my guest will close with a lesson learned that she would like to pass on to you as a listening audience. I am proud to welcome to Women's Business, Lisa Furtado. How are you, Lisa? I'm good, thank you. My goodness, how long have we been working together in, in our career? Probably about 12 years. Oh my gosh, 12 short years, absolutely. And how did you get in the business of human service? Um, I've been interested in human services for all of my life and always knew that I was going to grow up and do something in that field. And for early childhood, it just seemed like a perfect fit for me. Yeah, and the part that we're going to be talking about today is a very unique part of human services, um, early childhood child care, is called therapeutic child care services, correct? Yes. And therapeutic has not been around that long either, has it? No. No, how many years? Probably it? around 2007, therapeutic 2007. came to um, the state of Rhode Island. And approximately how many agencies in Rhode Island have do therapeutic child care services? Over 20 agencies do therapeutic throughout the state. And that's not many when you think of over a million people, over a million people, and a lot of child care centers, maybe three, four hundred child care centers, and no. all kinds of um, classrooms. Add those up, ten classrooms per child care center. So let. For our listening audience, explain what Therapeutic Child Care is. Um, therapeutic Child Care Services is a Kids Connect program regulated by the state of Rhode Island. It's a program for children with special needs to be able to be in an integrated environment, what we used to call mainstreaming children, into a typically developing day because we believe at Therapeutic Child Care Services that all children have the opportunity and should have the opportunity to learn and succeed alongside their typically developing peers. That is so important to say because I've been doing child care for over 40 years in a state of Rhode Island and some years in Massachusetts. And I need to tell you, back in, back in the day, long term, there were really no special programs for children with special needs. I know the school systems, I think it was like 1972, PL 142 law came in, and that opened up to special ed in the school departments. However, child care, as you said, only got involved in 2007. Right. So that has certainly opened up a lot of opportunities for a lot of families with children with special needs, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Um, we are able to um, do the social, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, um, the kinds of special needs that the school department isn't always able to focus in on, they have to stick to basically the education, mm -hmm. you know, um, points of what children are struggling with, but we are able to look at the whole child. And the other piece beyond that thing is we're starting at a very young age. We could have children in the early childhood facilities, 18 months old, two years old, People, you know, I know for um, one of my programs way back when I had a child was 18 months old, one with um, was it cerebral palsy, and she couldn't walk. And you go into the child care setting, and there she was in her walker with all the other, with her, as you say, the typically developing peers. It's, it's beautiful. And it's got to be beautiful for a parent to see, too. Yeah. Wow. Um, no, no child or no parent wants their children to be any different than any other child in a setting. Um, the amazing part that happens when we're inside of the classroom is that all children 
have something to learn. Yeah. Both the typically developing children and the children who have challenges. And with a few simple modifications most times and with some really good training of the staff, the therapeutic integration specialists in the classroom, we're able to provide these services and very successfully. And my understanding is you oversee maybe 12, 15 different child care centers in the state of Rhode Island with 18. special, I call it, I know it's called therapeutic child mm -hmm. care services. I call it, people understand it as special ed. Mm -hmm. 18, 18 daycares in the state of Rhode Island that you oversee, yep. that these programs have children with special needs. Yep. And the number one myth out there, Dr. Daycare hears all the time, if there's a daycare out there that have children with special needs, guess what? Um, they're going to disrupt the classroom. Not, not, not. Right, Lisa? Absolutely so, not you true. Do this every day. So <laughs> let's talk about that. So the people need to know that our kids, typically developing peers with children with special needs is only a win-win for everyone. It's a win-win for everyone because there are more um, staff in the classroom of what we call therapeutic integration specialist. We're able to be in the classroom, create interventions. We have clinicians that are independent licensed clinicians that visit each of our sites. They visit each child a half hour every week. They train the staff, they work with the directors. We work as a collaborative team. And honestly, the children get more out of being in a classroom with a therapeutic environment than they would get in a typically developing classroom because these are the kinds of environments that children learn life lessons in. And did I just hear you say children who have special needs who go into a classroom, do I hear you say there's gonna be an extra staff there called a TI? Yep. The Therapeutic Integration Specialist, Is we call it a TIS. TIS. Yep, there's always, we have a four to one ratio for the wow. therapeutic program. Amazing. Um, there is an offered two to one ratio also, but those are in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, they're individually based for services needed for, for each child. Um, but yes, the extra staff in the classroom is amazing. And the staff that were already in the classroom, the lead teachers, the head teachers, the directors, so appreciate the therapeutic integration specialists because they're able to tend to the needs of not only the therapeutic children, but also the other children in the classroom. Almost I like say, I always compare things to school department because I understand people tend to see it that way. It's almost like a teacher's aid for a child, um, which gives us certainly an extra pair of hands in the classroom to help out the two or three teachers that are already there. Yep, and That's the best part is that no child is ever ostracized for special needs. None of the other children know that Thank the therapeutic you. children are in therapeutic. No. None, you know, only the staff know and the staff are fully trained in all the interventions. So um, the children feel just like typically developing children in any other classroom. So you can walk into a classroom of 12 children and you could have two teachers plus a TIS. It's three teachers for 12 children, which is the as one to four ratio you talked about. And I wouldn't have any idea which child has special needs, correct? No, you wouldn't. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it that is amazing? amazing. It's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to see. And, but I, I also want to say, because we have them in our child care centers, so I know how this works, so I have an advantage, but we have Lisa, we have operations from um, that she's under per se, and then she has three clinicians who work for her that go into these classrooms and they work with the teachers. Lots and lots of training. I see my teachers all the time being trained by your staff. Why don't we talk a little bit about the training that the teachers get, which helps all teachers. Yep, so basically what we do is we focus most of our trainings on special needs mm -hmm. and what the special needs are for children. Um, we have what we call a therapeutic integration specialist training once a month where we bring the whole team, oh. meaning all of our therapeutic integration specialists throughout all of our um, therapeutic sites together. Um, and we train on specific things like interventions. For instance, one of the trainings that we have been recently doing is a camp training mm -hmm. to make sure that children who can transition from a classroom into the camp environment and you know all of the kind of little things even even if it's you know teaching children how to feel comfortable getting in line some children are not good with other children very close to them so we have to make sure that the staff knows that mm -hmm. and we also teach children interventions to be able to place themselves in the most comfortable spot that they can be in you know you talked about it school just ended we're going a lot of the kids are leaving the typical classroom before after school before school after school child care and they're going into full day camp settings or, or child care settings Things. And especially for children, the average child, never mind just special children. I know I travel over the world and I travel get on a plane for 12 hours and people start to shake like, how can you be on a plane for 12 or 15 hours? And 
takes a lot of meditation before I get to that <laughs> point. But as much anxiety that might create in other people, that is what a little nine or seven year old has to do when they go from a nice nurturing school system to an afternoon or a full day camp environment or a childcare environment. Think of that type of anxiety. And I'm hearing you have staff who are trained and then you have clinicians to go in and transition that child in. Right. Wow. wow. It's a perfect fit. It's and many of our fit. children are, we have across the board special needs. We can serve as children with autism. We can serve as children with attachment disorder. Um, and, and a lot of our children have anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's just a few modifications to help the staff and the child, and they're able to be successful. And I also, when you're training the staff, that teachers that are already there think of the life lessons they're learning for children and also for their children in the future and, and also just working with their nieces and nephews that's a, a special specialized type of training absolutely yeah. wow um tell me one of the most difficult days you had we can't mention any names of course but one of the most difficult days you might have had in um in your career with working with therapeutic child care I think, and how successful it came, of course. At the yes, end of, the day. of course. Yeah, yes. At the end of the day, it all ends up um, very successful. I think one of the most difficult things um, that happens in the therapeutic situation is um, not knowing a child yes. as much as we would like to know them mm -hmm. before they come into our center. And we do have policies and procedures. We never take a child in that we have not had full meetings on, that we have not contacted all of the collateral services. So everyone is sitting around the table when this child comes in. But the reality of it is that you don't really know until the child's there in your center. Yes. So, you know, we've had a couple of instances where that child has surprised us, and unfortunately... I like how you said surprised. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck happened? We just had this huge meeting for an hour and a half, and we had everything set up. And, and days of work. And days, days of, of work, work. And days of preparing, and that child, I love the way you said it, and that child surprises everybody. Go ahead, with right. the surprise. And we definitely, I mean, you know, there are definite times when a child is just not a four-to-one ratio, no. and just can not make it in a therapeutic environment. Honestly, I can count on one hand the amount of times that this has happened in any of our sites, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. and, and those are the most difficult days for me because mm -hmm. I'm a nurturing kind of person, so I yeah. want to be able to fix, make, make that, you know. Make that system work for that child. Yeah, help, yeah. The, help that parent because there aren't a lot of resources. But we yeah. never just let those parents go. We always make sure that we get in touch with resources, we pass them on, you know, to to um, higher level services that can help them. But those are the difficult days for me. Yeah. Who is the governing um, body in, in Rhode Island on this? Is there a special like, department to go to for therapeutic child or special ed? The Executive Office of Health and Human Service. Fabulous. Yes. And I know you work very closely with a lot of CETA programs, correct? Yes, there are four CETA programs throughout the mm -hmm. state. There is about families, um, there is Families First, there is Empowered Families, and there is Solution CEDAR. So if we have someone out there listening who has a child, could be four years old, behavior problem, this is, a, you know, a good, 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 good indicator is if your child's been asked to leave childcare many, many times in the last three or four years, I would definitely look at that, okay? And so that, let's say this program might be a fit for them. Do they contact the CEDAR? Is that my understanding first? Um, actually, either way is fine. Okay. You can open with the CETA program. A lot of times before CETA will open, um, if they're only opening for child care, they'll actually contact me. Okay. So contacting me directly would be fine, mm -hmm. and I can usually um, point you in the right direction as to um, you know, a CETA program and then also um, whether or not we have the available um, space in your yeah, area. Yeah, sometimes. Because right now, I hear space you have is wait <laughs> Yeah, I do have wait list and space yes. is very limited right now, um, especially going into the summer. Because yes. people, you know, they work around their children being in school, um, but when summer comes, everybody needs child care. So we are very, very busy at this time. Absolutely, a lot of transitions going mm -hmm. on. Let's think of it from another perspective. Let's say someone's out there who works in a child care center and they're like, oh my God, Lisa's talking about one of those kids. A child that's one of my classroom that keeps running out the door and taking, um, just say inappropriate words to kids of kids. And my goodness, I could utilize this in my, in my child care center or in my before and after school. Um, program, who would they contact for that? They would also contact me okay, for that. Okay, so you would be the contact yep. for both. I would definitely be that. 
Right, yep. right. Um, let's talk about a little bit about some of the trainings that you do with okay. the staff. Yep, some of the, um, we do a lot of therapeutic classroom environment trainings. We do a lot of trainings for um, specific interventions for children. Um, so for instance, um, if you have a child who is a runner, which we call in the field as an eloper, yeah. one, of the, one of the more simple things to do is put stop signs on your door and wow. start to teach the children, you know, th these are your boundaries. Because when children are displaying this kind of behavior, obviously they are not learning their boundaries another way, so they may need a visual, a visual, and they may need, you know, the TIS to stay in close proximity. Those are the kind of intervention trainings we mm -hmm. do. Um, I also do a lot of training on what we call the safe zone. In each one of our classrooms, we have a safe zone, and the safe zone is an area where the child voluntarily has the opportunity to go all day. I, I almost sometimes wish I had a safe zone. <laughs> Can you put one of those safe zones in my office? I, I know. Be able to fit it, but that's a great idea. Really. I know. But, um, in, you know, they go, they're full of pillows, there's books, we utilize some yoga poses, and, you know, the kids just know that I can go there and I can take a break, and these are the kind of skills that we want to teach children. We teach them the coping skills to be able to process where they are and, con you know, learn to control their emotions mm -hmm. and utilize the things that we have at the center. So why would a child, go, and I bet you the good news is once you teach that safe zone, you go and teach it to the staff or children um, therapeutic needs. I bet you any money, a lot of the children in the classroom are using that safe zone. It's Everyone a great has the skill. opportunity. That's why I love about special ed. Mm -hmm. The real skills that you have that can be utilized with every single child. There's a little bit of special ed in all of us. Yeah. We, all, we all know that. We all yes. know that. Deep down, we totally know yes. that. So when would a, um, a safe zone be used? And what does a safe zone look like? Um, it just, it's a carpet. It may be um, oh. big giant pillows um, that, you know, child size. They just lay on them. It, you know, it looks like, excuse me, it looks like the old book area back yes. in the day when yep. we had early childhood classrooms. And, you know, basically it's just a comfortable zone. Sometimes we also have, um, feeling charts in the safe zone oh, wow. so the children can identify how they're feeling, you know, if they're feeling sad or mad. Um, a safe zone is usually um, a child-directed activity, so we don't ever say to a child, you need to go in the safe zone. That's not how we do that. The children will say, you know, they'll get angry and if they're using their coping skills, they may say something like, I I'm really angry and I'm going to safe zone. <laughs> so we're like, okay. You we know. could use that at my home office. <laughs> I like, I, like this whole, I like this whole concept, actually, in my home, too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Talk about giving children, empowering children. Yep. Also empowering staff. The staff must be so excited when they see a child come in, as you said, could be a lopa, and next thing you know, they're sitting down at the table doing puzzles, drawing, doing, what's this, the whole thing, STEM, with all these uh, technology and yeah. all those pieces going on, which goes on in every one of these classrooms. And sometimes, quote unquote, kids can disturb that. And once you got the, the child sitting down and doing all of these activities, it must make the teachers feel so accomplished, so empowered too. And honestly, the teachers are not always empowered okay. when they see the new staff coming, yeah. I mean, the new children coming okay. in. Um, and, you know, they have their own kinds of anxieties about this mm. because even though the children are going to be there anyway, they get a little bit, ooh, they're going to mess up my classroom, not going to be able to line up the yeah. right way. You know, a perfect example of that is telling a teacher who's been teaching for over 20 years, children don't have to sit at circle time. Because when we were teaching 20, 25 years ago, that's what children did. They mm -hmm. all sat together in circle. And it's okay not to sit at circle time. But what do we do with that child who's not sitting in circle mm -hmm. time? We offer that child the safe zone, and we offer that child some kind of sensory activity so that that child can feel comfortable and never, ever believe that those children who are not sitting in the circle are not listening to everything that's going on because they're absorbing right where they're from. Totally absorbing. But yeah. once a teacher has a successful experience with a child, then you can just see the confidence in them and they just move forward and they're just like, okay, where's my next therapeutic child? I can do this. Wow. Yeah, wow. so it becomes a win-win for everyone. But it's a learning process. It's a learning yeah. curve for everyone. You know what I'd like to say too, uh, I was, you know, before and after school programs that we have, I was very, because um, I was very excited to see how you work so closely with the school departments. 
it's really cool how you have a great relationship with the special ed department mm -hmm. and how the school department is so invested into the child before and after school and of course their school day. So it's really, this, this family has a whole team behind it. They have a school behind it, they have um, your therapeutic program yep. behind it, you have teachers behind it, you have special ed teachers behind it, they're called TISs. Right. This is amazing, it's, it's gotta be a successful a successful process. Yes, and then, and, and I mean, most importantly on that team are the parents. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm a family advocate at heart, mm -hmm. and I mean, sometimes sitting to parents, it's very, sitting with parents, it's very difficult to say, like, your child needs something special because I'm a parent. I, I don't want to hear that from anyone. But in order for us to help children get through this process so that when they go to school, if they're not even in school yet, yeah. we can get them going to school ready to learn. And, and parents are a huge part. Mm -hmm. And usually when I first sit with a parent, there's tears. Yeah. There always is. We're all yeah. emotional about yeah. our children. And, and think about, I think when you say ready to learn, they're learning from the moment they take a breath somewhere. Absolutely. You know, uh, and for the first five years, and the good news is when they go leave early childhood programs who are so educationally involved, when they go to school, they're, they're learning, it becomes a nice process. And they love learning, and they're, 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 they're thrilled about learning, and it's, it's just part of th their day. And if you can get children at a very, very young age involved and understand learning, and you really can positively reinforce that, your child's gone on to graduate, graduate, graduate. I mean, in our day, high school education was a good thing. We need we need to go on for other folks. There's right. a lot of technical schools out there. There's a lot of colleges out there. There's a lot of community colleges out there. That certainly is the next step. Right, it's not an option anymore. Children need to be ready to learn. Yes. They, they, you need to be able to have, you know, go on with mm -hmm. your further education because, I mean, otherwise they're not gonna be able to succeed in society mm -hmm. today because, mm -hmm that we're, we're much higher level educated than we were. Which is fantastic. Which it's is, beautiful. It's, it's what a, we've been all striving That's for. That's what we've all been striving for. Years. I think it's happened. And it starts very, very early in early child education. Well, I must say, um, actually the show's 10 years old. I want to say that today. Um, but I also say you're very passionate about what you do. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about you. I, I know for a fact we share, grand, we share, we are both grandparents. We don't yes. share the same grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> trying to say this backwards, but we share being a grandparent because I yes. know a lot of times we talk, we talk a lot about our grandkids. So yes. we, we both have that, but tell me a little bit more about you. Um, I am married to Joe. Um, I married my high school sweetheart, <laughs> 28 years. Wow. Yep. Um, I have two children, Joseph and Jonathan, um, and they are 26 and 22. And I have two grandchildren, Alicia and Joseph. And happy birthday to Joseph today. Wow. He turned three today. Three. Oh my God. Yes. Man, this is three. Wow. So wow. exciting. But yeah, I mean, I, I am very passionate about what I do. I'm very passionate about children. I'm very passionate about helping or never having children feel that they're less than yeah. in an environment, yeah. especially in an environment of education, mm -hmm. because we all need to feel like we belong somewhere. And absolutely, and the other thing too is it's important that children succeed in school. That all comes, I, I always, I try and stay with today, but I got myself projected out there once again, but that also has to do with the dropout rate. Yeah. So if children are three years old and not feeling successful in an early childhood school situation, at 13 years old, they're not gonna feel, and by 15 or 16, they're done with it. Right. So it's really important parents, teachers, everyone, to really get your child involved in, the early, in a very, very young age into learning. It doesn't mm -hmm. just start one day in kindergarten. Right. You don't turn that switch on. You gotta turn that switch on from the day they're born. And some people start, my sister-in-law, her son's now 25 years old. She started, she was a um, um, professor in, um, and uh, RISD, and a, liter a literacy teacher. So she started reading to her child when he was in utero. And when I see him today at 25 years old, and he, he totally loves to read, so I think there's a connection there. But yeah, it's so important to have an environment that children will be all successful in a learning environment. Right, and I think in the special needs field too, that if parents could try, and I know how difficult it is, but try to have an open mind and listen to the professionals and the teachers that are speaking to you so that they can help you to get to the next step to help your child. Wow. And I always like to go back, way, way back, so if you go back as far as you can, who was a significant person who uh, got you involved in being a, a working woman today, a woman in business? Oh my goodness, that's a tough question. There have been a few. That's okay, you can say a few. Over the years. Really. Do I get to say you as oh, one? Yes. <laughs> you were very young when you met me, absolutely, yes, yes. Yes, 
No, I mean, I've had so many good mentors, but I mean, I think having this experience doing therapeutic mm -hmm. and really um, being successful at this program has really, really made me understand business more than I have before. Yeah, I find a lot of people who are very much into the family advocacy, such an important thing, special education, so important, humanistic end of it, and I was one of those, I had to come over to the other side business because all this costs money, yes. as we all know, yes. absolutely. So yes. it's hard to, I know you have a budget every year that you gotta, you gotta pinpoint it, but that's a whole nother part. It's hard to take human services and know there's a, there's a finance piece of it, but it all comes together and it's yes. all such a part of it, absolutely. And, and it's part of the, the bigger team. I mean, obviously yeah. everyone that we work with and everyone that I look up to yeah. um, helps me through that process, but it certainly is a process. It is. Um, if someone's interested, do you have a website by any chance? Yes, I do. I have a therapeutic child care um, um, Facebook page, and we also have a therapeutic child care website. Okay, and what would that website say? Someone gets their child into special ed. Is there a, is it www? Dot, Dr. Daycare dot com. Uh, okay, you're fine. Therapeutic. Therapeutic. TCCSRI. There you go. TCCSRI.com. Um, or they can contact you too. Yeah, www.tccsri.com. Oh, okay. Got it, got it. Great. I have, everything's a website today. My daughter taught me that. Mom, you don't pick up the phone anymore. You just go to the website. I'm like, okay, okay. And you ask questions from there. I would like to also, and we got like a couple of minutes left, but um, how do you do it all? How do you balance it? You're a grandmother, you got a two sons, you're married, you're working. Tell me how you do it all. I love it all. Okay. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. To be mm -hmm. able to wake up every single day and love what I do. Okay. That's the difference. I mean, when I see a child be successful, when I get to speak with a family and tell them how well their child's doing, that's, that's what matters at the end of the day. And to be able to go home and hug my own children and my own grandchildren and yeah. enjoy great times with them, that's really living. Yeah, that is really living, absolutely. Is there any lesson that you learned in your career that someone out there is like, okay, this woman's got a lot of experience, this woman has a lot of expertise, there's gotta be something that she's learned throughout her career that she can pass on to the listening audience? I definitely have learned one thing, and everyone who works with me will appreciate me saying this, and I've learned it quite recently, actually. You can't fix every child. Wow. You have to wow. be able to sit back and look at the facts and realize that there are some that you know you have to refer and you have to offer services to, but that you can't fix every child or every situation. Yeah, I, I like what you said too. We'll, we'll give you resources, we'll give you services, we'll get you to the next step because yep. there are the people who out there could be a complete support system, absolutely. Yep. Well, this is, Lisa, this has been a very, very informative um, women's business on therapeutic child care services. Uh, I know because my own, my own facilities, I have them in the classroom and we love them. It's made our lives a lot easier. Always at my desk, there would be situations where children would have to leave. I'm like, good God, why is this child leaving? And now to know that if we have a child who's been in child care, that we have a whole team of professionals who can go in and really support and help the family and keep the child in child care. So thank you so much for, um, for being a part of our show today. Thank you.